Magandang araw, Podmates! Howie Severino muli na napapaalala na nakakatalino ang mahabang attention span. Ang guest natin ngayon ay isa na namang dakilang Pilipina, si Kara Magsanok Alikpala, filmmaker at ang isa sa producers ng Delikado, a thrilling environmental documentary about illegal logging in Palawan that is an Emmy Award finalist in the United States. Magandang araw si Kara and congratulations! Thanks, Howie. Good day to you and to all your fans and followers. <laughs> Marami yon. Dakila ka rin. Miss dakila ka pa sa amin lahat. <laughs> Salamat, Kara. So, ano bang ibig sabihin para sa yung, yung pagiging Emmy Award finalist? You know, yeah, I mean, it's such a cliche, but I, I'm really honored. I feel like a winner already. I was so stunned <laughs> okay. when I found out. Parang, ha, Emmy? Em- you know, like people at home, Emmy sa, sa Philippines? USA said, hindi Emmy, as it, the Emmy Awards, <laughs> the oh, Emmy Awards. But uh, this is a this is a US uh, TV award, no, yung yung Emmy because it was shown in the United States, di ba? On a yes. US TV show, yung yes. uh, POV, which is that's why it qualified, yeah, yes, oh, that's why it qualified. It was shown yeah. in the US. Okay, but this is just the latest, no, uh, award or recognition for Delicado, itong documentary you're one of the producers for this uh, and it's been screening screening around the world no in various uh, film festivals aside from uh US TV you know so what what kind of audience reactions have you been getting to delicado um the most common is we did not know it was happening in this very idyllic you know province uh it's like a world destination one of the best resorts in the world so they're shocked that this is happening um, and number two, even though they know it's been happening, they never really knew what it looked like inside the forest, what goes on. Mm-hmm. I mean, wow, ganito pala to kasalimuot, ang hirap-hirap pala, no? So those are the two common reactions. And third, really, what can I do? I'm not a land defender. I, I don't work in the forest. I'm just mm-hmm. a citizen. As a tourist, I want mm-hmm. to know, is there a list of, you know, resorts you can recommend mm-hmm. that, that actually have sustainable practices? Yan yung mga mm-hmm. questions sa mga, mm-hmm. you know, ordinary citizens. Mm-hmm. Which, which are good questions. They the forest up. being featured here where, where some of the illegal logging has been taking place is in is in is near or in El Nido, no? It's, it's a uh, drive away, but oh yeah. El Nido, of course, is famous for the beaches and you know the islands and, and mga re- world class resorts, Jan. No? Pero yun nga may nangyayari pa lang uh, ganito sa, sa malapit lang dito sa itong uh, tourist destination na, na pamoso, no? So maybe that's part of the surprise here about Delicado. But yeah, I mean, I think you should all watch the film because we all have a responsibility to create our own response to this because it happens not only in Palawan, but other parts of the country um, and, and in other spaces of the environment, whether it's mining, you know, on overfishing. And damage. In fact, um, it has found so much um, uh, parang meaning to other land defenders in like, other countries like Brazil, where we get really warm reception, and they also have the same problem. Even in Malaysia, wow, such good reactions from land defenders there. They also want to use the film as a tool to promote their own causes. Even this group called Climate Reality, it's like a, a group that Al Gore um, created, and there is a, a chapter here. They show it even to people who protect the mangroves. So any environmental group can use it. So it's part of our impact campaign to screen directly to stakeholders who can use the film to create change and impact. Yeah, so you're 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 telling our audience to, to watch it. Pero paano nga? I mean, is this on streaming yeah, anywhere? Or, oh, okay. Um, well, you know, the commercial theaters have declined us. Masyado daw delikado yung topic. So there you go. Um, so we're just hosting a lot of private screenings as much as we can. Of course, it's not cheap. So you'll just have to stay posted on our Delicado Facebook page um, to see where we, we'll be. Right now, as we speak, we're, we're screening in Iloilo mm-hmm. and soon in Paano? Naga. We will have okay. private screenings. We will oh. let you know. In the U.S., nga, they're a little luckier because like now that the film's nominated, uh, POV is streaming it. They're streaming all oh. their Emmy-nominated uh, films. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. For the whole season and up until the Emmys, so yeah, it's easier to watch it abroad actually than to watch it here. But yeah, well, with our the, impact the, campaign the, roll out, people, we'll, the people in the US who are listening to this now, so <laughs> so they yeah, can they I can watch can it, catch it there. No? Yes, we even have an mm-hmm. educational partner there, Good Docs, where you can contact them if you want to show them in your schools. 
that's mm-hmm. possible too. Or just message us on our Facebook uh, page because we can also help screenings anywhere in the world. We have impact partners who can help stage a screening. And we're rolling out the campaign here. So we're, we'll be going all over the country. And we have actually begun um, really just screening to communities and to students and to organizations, NGOs, and some private groups. So it's been a quiet crawl. <laughs> so tungkol naman sa content nito, no? it's, a, it's about uh, environmental activists in Palawan who are doing citizen arrests and confiscation of uh, confiscations of chainsaws. No? Pa- parang delikado nga yung ginagawa nila. But how, how dangerous is this? Buis buhay ito, Howie. Um, it, it, it can cost you your life. Every day that they go out or just stand waiting to go out, you know, their life is at, at risk. They actually gamble the futures of their families doing this kind of job. Nobody wants to do this, but they know they have to. In fact, the one who started um, the practice of confiscating chainsaws and, you know, doing arrests of this kind was DENR in Palawan. Um, and, and that lady... The government. Yes, the DNR, but again later on, I guess some authorities in Palawan didn't didn't agree with it, and then she lost her job and was reassigned to Manila. But this foundation, PNNI, was inspired by her work. So, pero iba pag government ang gumawa, no? Because that's basically plain law enforcement. Kasi yeah, but, but, but nga, you know, eh, um, I mean, pero pag, they, pag they have lawyers gumawa, and it is legal. They have lawyers who have vetted, you know, the process. It is legal for citizens to do that. It is possible. Well, so they never really jail question. anyone, if you notice. They just apprehend and then sometimes take them to where they should go. But really, there's really no, no one goes to jail or anything, which is really why all the more those in authority and those with the resources should be doing their jobs Someone has to be accountable. So how how, keep so how rampant how rampant is this in the Philippines? So it may pinakita ka yung mga certain areas sa Palawan. Uh, pero uh, is it is it going on beyond those areas in Palawan? Uh, may, may mga ibang lugar sa Palawan? Kasi I, I alam ko may nagkaroon ng uh, ban sa commercial uh, logging sa Palawan no years ago. Uh, maybe decades ago. Kasi nag, naging uh, malaking issue yan noon eh. No? Yung logging dyan. Um, so ngayon, there's this illegal logging that uh, you're featuring in this in this. Uh, it movie. is rampant. I don't have the uh, figures, but it is rampant, um, and it is dangerous. Remember, the Global Witness Group ranked us at one point as the most dangerous place in the world for land defenders. I think 2018, 2017, you know that recent. Um, and and anyone should take a look at the report. We are being depleted really fast. So wait, wait. Did how did they? Yeah, how, how did they? How did they rank us the most dangerous for? Oh, they did defenders? investigations. They went through different countries where land defenders were threatened. So they they did um so a long and study, killings, and they were no? here. Yeah. So nagkata on lang now while they were doing that, we were doing the film. So we met them, and you know we were helping each other, but we did not do it because we knew they had this. No, not at all. It's a story that the director stumbled upon. The director is Australian, who used to live in the Philippines. I see Carl. Yeah. I see Carl. He uh, used to uh, head uh, uh, the Ajans France Press. He was the bureau yeah, chief. Oh, he was going to Palawan oh. for a fluff piece tourism. Para ah, mm-hmm. iba hindi na ako news tourism Palawan relax din ako. Mm-hmm. His contact at that time for the story was Jerry Ortega and then of course mm-hmm. just when he was planning the trip Ortega is shot because of all the work he's doing um protecting the environment. So Carl went to Palawan to investigate this, find out more and he stumbled upon all these land defenders. That's how it started. So oh. Jerry Ortega so, led him to these stories in a way. Yeah, so pa- legacy na rin ni Jerry to, no? Uh, yeah, I know he was a radio true. commentator. I used to be in yes. touch with him as well. Uh, masipag yan when it comes when it came to the matapang. Uh, environment. Oh, matapang masipag. So, what are you trying to change dito sa sa delikado? Wow, ang hirap ng tanong. What are you trying to change? <laughs> well, the immediate thing right now, let's say for delikado besides of course preserving, you know, whatever's left of Palawan and for other people, wherever they are to preserve their environment is to protect the land defenders. So many of them are dying and no one deserves to die or feel threatened for protecting the environment. Like what one of our, um, one of the indigenous women in the film, the way she, you know, when you talk to them, they protect the earth 
with their whole life because they they treat the earth as a member of the family. They call the earth their parent. So it's so important for them that, you know, you protect this member of the family at all costs. So, I mean, we want everyone to feel that way, whether you just, whether you live in Metro Manila or elsewhere, um, you have to live consciously. Um, and anything you do, remember, there is a consequence. Someone might live or die when you do something irresponsibly. It's all connected. And, you know, whatever you can do, do your bit. I mean, you know, one of the best things I heard was John Lloyd, the actor. He, he He's building a house in Pal Palawan, in El Nido. In fact, when he was hibernating, that's where he was all this time. He loves Palawan. And he was saying, Nako, dahil sa inyo, hindi na ako makabili ng kahoy. Ang hirap-hirap bumili ng, ano, ng, ng kahoy sa Palawan, paggawa ng bahay. Well, I guess hardwood, no? I wouldn't know what kind of wood he was looking for. But stuff like that, that's the change we hope. So, so napanood ni John Lloyd ito? And he was because that's why I he think was so. Yeah, yeah, things. yeah. And he he met the director in Australia because our film was competing there, and so was his film. So, yeah, there's a lot of engagement with him about the film. Mm -hmm. So changes like that would make us happy. Of course, on the highest level, that would be the best. I don't even need a new law. There's so many beautiful laws. We just really um, need to implement the laws and save Palawan and other places. You know, would would, would you know pristine environment. But yeah, in any you... documentary I do, it's usually it usually comes with an impact campaign. Um, I don't know if it's a new thing, maybe in the last 20, 30 years, there's a movement. Um, in fact, I'm part of a group called the Global Impact Producers. Um, it was started by the British Documentary Society where um, people who do documentaries, I guess mostly social justice themed documentaries, who make sure that their films create impact. It's not never just awareness. But making sure change happens or you offer your film as a tool for different stakeholders who can actually use it to create their own change, changing behaviors or, you know, giving them ideas how to, you know, improve their space, stuff like that. So, in fact, I'm trying to fill build in the Southeast Asia um, impact producers in, 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 in the U.S., Europe or other counterparts in, um, in the Middle East. When they do budgets for their documentaries, nakapasok na yung impact producer, yung impact producing team. Mm, wow. Yeah, I it's a whole that. new universe, right? It's also yeah. a way of, it's also alternative distribution in a way because a lot of our films, are, a lot of documentaries will never find homes in all these, you know, swanky commercial cinemas. Um, iisipin nila lagi, wala namang manunood, di ba? Wag na lang. So we have to create our own <laughs> outlets. Yeah, well, that's a that's a great concept, no? Because uh, it's it's one way of uh, widening the dissemination of the work, but at the same time, you know, you want to influence public opinion through the impact. You know, yeah, and impact going direct activities. to the stakeholders who who need that uh, impact. Yeah, who need to feel that galing. impact the most. Yeah, mm -hmm. galing, yeah. It's a good model for for other filmmakers. Because, ah, uh, maraming ano filmmaker pag nat natapos na yan, they'll go on to another project. Bahala. <laughs> Bahala uh, na, no? Kung anong yeah. magiging... Hindi ko nga kaya ng gano'n. Iba, let go, no? But I'm married to the topic yeah, and yeah. the protagonist for life. Mm. But you've been doing a documentary since the 1990s. And before that, of course, you were you were working uh, at Pro, uh, Pro Productions where uh, you, know, you learned uh, a lot about TV and, and production. But you were you started doing independent uh, documentaries in the 90s with you No More Sabado Nights uh, in 1996. Oh, for PCIJ, yeah. Yes, oh, uh, and um, well, that was an independent production with, you know, with it was collaboration with BCIJ, but that was about um, the domestic abuse, no, the abuse of women, uh, and then in 1997 you did Batas Militar, which is which is um, I think much much better known, no, because it, it got a lot of um, uh, screenings. Uh, it was about martial law, no, martial law using a lot of. I think it's uh, the most bootlegged, of... most bootlegged documentary. In the country, oh my gosh, ang daming uh, copyright infringement, but sige na lang. I'll yeah, turn a blind yeah, eye. And well, that, People need to watch yeah, but, it. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. And in those days, hindi masyadong... So I'm conflicted about that, okay? So. Hindi masyadong binibigyan ng attention yun. No? But in fact, I heard that uh, it's no longer accessible, partly for that reason. Tama? Yeah, different networks are starting to block, you know, their own... Mm -hmm material that they know is being pirated so we don't have resources like that i wish we did but so people who have resources are doing it so you you may find like we did a history channel documentary and so there are some chapters are, that are missing or some scenes because some tv stations started to block it yeah 
Uh, and that's too bad because um, it, it's an important film. No, it's about recent history, martial law. No, which is of course st still relevant uh, today. Um, but wh why do you think um, so many bootlegged it or or copied it and you know screened it you know without your permission? Uh, what what do you think uh, explains that? I think they wanted to know what happened back in the day. You know, it, it we didn't have uh, we didn't have internet and all that back in the day. You didn't see a lot of things unless the newspapers or the television came out with it. So I think one of the things back then when we came out with the film was we showed video that was never shown before. You know, the, shall I say, the ugly side of martial law or the real side of martial that people didn't know about. So people need to know. People still debate if it really happened. And so they use the film to probably settle a score with someone they're discussing or debating mm -hmm. Um, a lot of teachers use it in schools. I've met so many students who who've watched it in school. It's required, you know, a required thing. In fact, I'm I'm sure you know Shao, the historian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he said he was inspired to be a historian because of Batas Militar. Um, wow. He memorizes the dialogue word per word. <laughs> oh my! So I know. Yeah, yeah. I was so thrilled uh -huh. to meet him. Um, but yeah, you know, so and that film, you know, when we were told to do that film. Um, the producers told us um, the message is the price of democracy is eternal vigilance. You know, kami parang corny naman, no? di ba basic yun? Parang, oh, okay, basic, sige, but yun pala, it's hard to to really heed this, um, I don't know, this theme that we were trying to propagate. It's not easy. I guess eternal vigilance talaga. You really can't let your guard down. And then you circled back to martial law in a more recent work, 2022 lang, itong uh, 11,103, yan ang pamagat nitong uh, pelikula mo, no? about human rights victims uh, during martial law. And that number, yung 11,103 that became the title, uh, is, uh, is the number of uh, victims, human rights victims who were compensated no? uh, for what they went through, what they endured. Uh, or suffered during martial law. No? Uh, what, what, ano, how do you choose your projects? <laughs> and how did you choose that one? I think Destiny uh, just wants me to keep doing martial law stories. <laughs> I keep finding myself, I don't know, here. We did 11103 um, because it was the 50th anniversary of martial law. Um, mm. We've done so many martial law stories for History Channel or whatever channel. And um, We've done it usually in different ways. And it's always usually one was with a voiceover, one was told from the point of view of all the decision makers, uh, anal analysts, analysts, and all this. And what people remember the most whenever we do that are the stories of the human rights uh, survivors or those who did not make it. Yan ang naaalala nila more than you know someone's analysis or take on martial law. So we decided why not just dedicate you know, a documentary to their stories so 11103 is about real stories of people who suffered under martial law, even massacre, you know, families who survived massacres, they are there. Um, and when you see them speak, I think you can tell that they're not lying. And 11,103, just to clarify, it's a very small number. They're actually over, there are hundreds of thousands of victims of victims. I don't actually want to call them victims, you know, maybe heroes, martyrs, but there are a lot more, Survivors. but these were the ones documented. You know how it is? Some people don't even have IDs. They don't even know the date of birth. So, but, you know, it's the requirement of the law. Even um, when uh, set, uh, Attorney Swift also did another, there was another claimant uh, group. Um, same thing. The same uh, rules were required by the U.S. You have to have an identification. You should have had a witness and all this. But who who will be witnessing your torture, right? Who who's going to do that affidavit? So it was hard to vet. So eleven one hundred three is a very small number. But the eleven thousand one hundred three were the ones who were compensated, no, with, yes. with money, no. So yes. saan galing yung pondo na yon? Saan galing yung pera? Anang galing yung pera na yan from the ill-gotten wealth of the Marcoses, galing sa Swiss banks. So this was based on a landmark law that um, former president, the late president uh, Benigno Aquino Jr. passed. Um, and the law says that this ill-gotten wealth will go to these human rights, you know, 
survivors, and martyrs. Um, right there and then, you have the acknowledgement of two facts, that wealth was ill-gotten, and that, yes, there were human rights violations. Um, and uh, Senator Enrile and Senator Bomo at the time were members of Congress when the law was signed. I won't say so, any more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've been doing this topic now for, I mean, you you know, you started in 97 with, with, with Batas Militar. And I know you've been, you've done um, work since then, aside from 11-103, you know, uh, and you know these were powerful films. They they were distributed widely. So everyone, they were being used in schools. Many um, more mm -hmm. historian in dialogue. Uh, so may impact, no. Uh, however, uh, as we've seen, no, adaming hindi na niwala pa rin. No? <laughs> na nangyari to. There's you know this whole narrat these narratives about you know it wasn't so bad and um, you know there was a it was actually a golden age, no. Um, and which uh, all of that influenced the election of 2022. You know? So, uh, so how do you feel <laughs> about that? Um, uh, well, I feel like a failure. <laughs> I feel like a failure. I feel um, as also a relative of several human rights victims. I also feel betrayed. Um, and I don't want to go anywhere further. There have been so many, you know, analysis on this. But as a filmmaker, and that's all the that's all I can really do is to just really invite more filmmakers or people who live the times to tell their stories. We have to flood, you know, any outlet, any media outlet with our stories. The way the way the Holocaust victims just have their stories all over. Whenever I go to a film festival abroad, there's always a topic on the Holocaust, whether directly, you know, related or not directly related. How can you forget? You know, they keep retelling stories in a way that's relevant for the generation uh, of, of that day. And we should just keep doing that. So whenever we, we screen the films, we keep telling people, if you just have a cell phone, talk to your Lola, talk to your Tita, ask them to tell their story. You know, it seems so easy, but it's not easy for them to tell their stories. Everyone we interviewed actually were, most of them were telling their stories for the first time. And it's still traumatic for them up to now. They never really processed it. There's some shame involved. Um, and even if their families knew, they never told the details. So we we've had we had a, an interviewee where his son was at the you know a few feet away, and right after we stopped the cameras, he said, Tang di man sinabi sa akin, ginanong ka, ginanong, and then he cried. You know, they didn't know these things. It's hard for them to talk about. In, in fact, even um very famous activists, people who you see on TV all the time, you know, started to sit down and because we would talk to them and say, yeah, you know, actually, I, I haven't really told all the details. It's not easy. And I don't know why. So can you imagine a whole, you know, generation of people like this going around without having processed their trauma? And, you know, I mean, and this, wow. and, yeah, and this, this, and this generation is fading away. So, yes, and it's ito, generational, it passes on to the other, you know, like even, um, yeah, you know, Aida Maranan, right? Um, so we were just interviewing her, everybody knows her story, and then her son, who was there when you're we interviewing her, was saying something like, um, he still has the feeling of being watched and all that. And this was just like in, I don't know, 2017, 2018. And Ida was so shocked to find out. I mean, he's a, a, a grown adult and, you know, she felt so guilty about it. So these things keep surfacing or some people are, are you know, mad at the kilusan or just, not the kilusan, but for their parents fighting. It's like, hindi, hindi kayo naging parents sa amin. Ang daming, daming issues, I mean, mm -hmm. brought about, you know, by these people who fought for our democracy. But the irony is whenever we interview these people, they're the ones who have never given up hope, you know, despite the win of a, a Marcus again. And they keep saying, no, we have to keep, uh, stay stay the course and keep fighting for democracy. Uh, they're the most reasonable, most, you know, hopeful people I know, despite the trauma they've been through. Um, there's one guy, uh, he's Muslim, part of the Palembang massacre. Um, mm -hmm. sometimes he, he he wakes up in the middle of, of the night and goes to the garden and he can't sleep. He's crying. He can't even tell his wife why. But, you know, the trauma <clears throat> still haunts him. So despite your feeling that you failed, no, in a way, uh, you're going to keep doing this. And, and you think the rest of us should keep doing it as well. 
Yes. I don't think failure, maybe that's too strong, but I know if we influence some pockets here and there, that's still planting seeds. But if more of us do this, you can create a bigger ripple because it's not even just about the Marcoses. It's just really protecting your democracy. It can even mean democracy in school. You know, if there's, you know, if someone's doing something wrong, call it out. Do not stay silent. If someone is bullying you in school, Tell the teacher if the teacher doesn't believe you. Tell the principal if the principal doesn't tell you. Find professional help. But someone has to know you have to be seen. You have to be heard. Someone has to be accountable. I mean, that's the that's the most important thing for me. That's what we want to teach. You cannot stay silent. You cannot stay silent when you see something that's not something wrong or something on you know if you see injustice. On many of these films, especially the more prominent ones you've been involved in, you're credited as the producer, not the director. Usually the director is better known. People understand what the director does. No? But the producer for these films, uh, what, what did they do? What did you do, for example, on Delicado? Alam mo, aping api talaga ang producer. You know, it's always like, producer lang, di ba? Or not may double discrimination pa, at TV producer ka lang. You know, may ganyan. I don't know if you've ever felt that, you know, hindi ka pala, ano, cinema or whatever. But actually, the lines are kind of blurred now, no? Um, and we're trying to unite the community. You can define however way you want to be the producer. But basically, you're the conductor. That's the easiest way to put it. I mean, as a producer, um, I get involved in the writing because I love writing um, and I like interviewing. So I, I get involved that way. So I my involvement is in, in different ways. I, I don't necessarily fundraise, which I hate to do because I also run a cancer foundation. I do so much fundraising. So usually I um I prefer to supervise production than um than do the fundraising part. But of course it's inevitable. I end up doing it as well. So you're actually the, I don't know, you're the mother of the entire thing, running the whole show and making sure you provide uh, a work environment where everyone can perform their best and everybody works well together. Um, so you, you'll have fun on our on our sets. You know, nobody ever curses. Nobody's fighting. It's a, it's a peaceful set. Um, it, there's very good synergy and uh, there will be discourses, but they're all healthy. So I usually work with the same people, the same pool of people. Um, with shared values. Some people, some producers don't write, don't get into production. They just do the money part. You know, some people just do that. There are many ways, you know, you can define a producer for documentaries. It depends also on the producer. I mean, we actually well, yes. have a director, yeah. which the producer engages. Kumbaga, the producer, you know, makes the many of the decisions. It's not even, you know, it's not even the host, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's the producer who. who yes. I, and I also you only know. want to work with people who want to collaborate. You know, you get involved in the editing, the output mm -hmm. of the editing, mm -hmm. um, even directing and the directors I've worked with are very open. I mean, not just me, anyone on the set can give their opinion. We actually always show the rough cuts to everyone. Um not involving post-production. In fact, the nice thing about Delicado, the director is a first time director. I mean, remember this guy's working with a print medium and he even had to Google how to make a documentary. <laughs> he's a foreign correspondent, diba? Right? So yes, he's, he was beer chief really, uh, of a John's France press at that time in Manila. Mm -hmm. He's now in Hong Kong, deputy um, beer chief for the region. So, um, so the post-production was totally collaborative because it was his first time. So there were so many of us, you know, and it was online during lockdown helping out in the edit. It was a bloody two-year edit, <laughs> practically two years for Delicado. But it was a true mm. collaboration of different minds and hearts and souls. You know, it, it it's had different cuts, Delicado, and I don't know, it, it took different directions and what you see is what we actually all agreed upon. Your mom was the highly respected newspaper editor, Leti Jimenez uh, Magsano, no? So, she was a long-time uh, editor in print, and uh, I know she also did a magazine. Uh, but she was she was known even during martial law as a brave journalist. She kept pushing, pushing back on, on the on on the regime and as, asserting uh, press freedom uh, at a time when you know there was still official censorship. You know? So, what kind of influence did she have on you? and your career choices and um, any temptation to do print journalism um influence how do i say it um i mean influence it's huge maybe influence i can't even you know put a finger on but um 
she made her life a prayer. And so I think I tried to imbibe that. She was very spiritual, not, I wouldn't say just religious, but spiritual. And if you are that prayerful, your commitment to your country is total because it's your commitment to God in a way. Um, that's why she was brave and clean because it's her commitment to God through country. People forget that. They don't understand that sometimes when they do what they do, um, it's not just about them or the security of their family. For her, it was all about faith because her whole life was a prayer. So, I mean, essentially, that's how she influenced me. You're always aware that it's not just about you or your family. You always have this, especially if you live in a, you know, a low income country. I, I think everyone here has a responsibility to do something outside, you know, your comfort zone. It's a crime not to. There's just too many poor people. You know, too many people without access to opportunities. We all have to do our bit. And that's what she did. Um, and in fact, she even says that she's not brave. She was just clueless and perhaps ignorant of the risks of her job. Yeah. It's like, it's not something she went out to. I want to be brave. I want to do an expose. It just felt so natural for her to do her duty as a citizen. She saw something wrong. She called out this person and held that person accountable. It was that simple for her. and But yeah, I've been surrounded with storytellers all my life. And my mom is one. So of course, it had an influence on me. Um, print. You know, when I first tried to... Um, I actually studied print. I even have a master's degree in print. Um, and, and when I came home to Manila, I tried to write. You know, it was so hard to write because um, if I write something well, they say my mother did it. And, and if it's bad, they're like, oh, she can never mess up to her mom. Maybe unconsciously that discouraged me. But then also, you know, when I first came home from the U.S. from studying, I, I saw the probe team on TV and it really caught my attention. I mean, the storytelling with images really grabbed my attention. So I guess that start, I started to think about that medium. And I find it a very dynamic medium. Parang bitin na ako sa print. And at the same time, I don't think I anymore have the tools to really write, you know, as if something were coming alive. And my writing is so new. So it's a who, what, when, where with a little sarcasm. But yeah, I'll stick to uh, film and video for now. Okay, you have another persona no? as a uh, cancer survivor and advocate you advocate for um other survivors uh and current patients no uh you you're building a support system you have a foundation no? uh tell us about that uh, why did you decide to be public about it um a lot of a lot of people would rather keep it under wraps not really talk about it very much but you've been quite vocal about it um very public uh about your what you've been through, uh, breast cancer, no, Cara? Yeah, like I said earlier, you can't live in this country with no risk, you know, with, with a lot of poor people and not do something about, something you can do about. That's why I do this. So when I was doing Batas Militar in 1997, that year, for some reason, I was just so happy about my life. And um, every New Year's, Eve, we have a resolution, Cartolina, where we write all our resolutions or what we're thankful for. And I just said, thank you for all, all these opportunities and give me the, make me an instrument of your peace, Lord. That's what I wrote. And in my mind, oh, this means Batas Militar, you know, it will open minds and whatever. And shortly after that, uh, while we were, we just wrapped um, filming for Batas Militar, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So in my mind, instantly, the first thing that came to my mind, oh my gosh, this is uh, my answered prayer to be an instrument of peace. I didn't know how I was going to be used, but I figured this is how I'm going to be used. It's not, it wasn't really just Batas Militar or the awards that it reaped, you know. So at that point, too, you know, having a desire for awards, even though they were just bonuses, already died. They didn't really mean much to me, but of course, it, it's appreciation for the team, which I appreciate. But um, so, and I was misdiagnosed. So there are many things. I would have done differently if I knew, um, but not everybody gets the benefit of hindsight. So that started, that embarked me on my advocacy. You know, so I had to go to the U.S. for a second opinion. This was like 26 years ago. So things were so different. Back in the day, the doctor-patient relationship was like, you know, father confessor. 
you you don't ask me questions. I just tell you what's going on. You can't, you know. But when I got to the States, one of the things that the doctors asked me was, so this is what's happening. What do you want us to do? What's your next step? I'm like, I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the doctor. So they really expect you to be an informed patient and a partner in decision making, a partner in your healing. So that started to open my mind. So when I came home, I wanted others to um to have the benefit of my journey, which is getting checked early so you catch cancers earlier. If you have an instinct that something is wrong, then you know go entertain that instinct and know where to go. Um, and so we started the foundation called the I Can Serve Foundation. We were just four women, women friends who survived cancer. And we really had no direction. We just went to different public hospitals, helping and talking to women. Um, and then, you know, every week, Every week, somebody would call us, can you talk to my friends? So every week, may merienda kami, ka merienda, rich, poor, middle class. No? And it's the same concerns. There's fear. They don't know where to go for financial help. So later on, we decided to, you know, do, to be more pro- proactive. And we set up uh, our flagship program called Ating Dibdibin. It's a partnership with a local government or a city. And we want cities because mayors call the shots with the city health office where we institutionalize Ating Dibdibin. Um, which is called a breast cancer control program, where you really make sure a patient is taken care of from the beginning, from the time she or he discovers the lump, up until the time you know she's done with treatments, or if she's uh, stage four, there's palliative care, hospice care, survivorship care. So the whole continuum of care is taken care of in our partners. And this is enshrined in a local law. If the city doesn't want to put it in a local ordinance, then we don't partner with them because it won't be sustainable, there won't be funding. If ibang kausap ng mayor, magiiba. So that's one of the most important things. So we put in patient navigation because we realized you need hand holding from beginning to end para makompleto ng patient in buong proseso and financial navigation. So our, the patient navigators in our cities look for um, you know help from national agencies like PCSO, DSWD, DOH, and then they also milk local funding. So if you are a citizen, or um, uh, if you live in one of the cities where partners with your out-of-pocket cost is so much, so much smaller, or maybe zero. So we're saving more. We're saving more lives. We're catching cancers earlier because we're cultivating the habit of you know doing breast self exams, going to the barangay health center if you suspect something, and just going for a checkup even though you don't suspect anything. So, so that's what we're doing Kara, essentially. Can I kind of ask you about your own illness? So I, I, I. Presume you're you're cured, no? Uh, you went to the states, you got treatment. And bang, were you was it already advanced or was it early detection? And how how difficult was your your journey uh, into recovery? I wasn't early detection because I I had I saw the lump two years prior to my diagnosis. But the doctor kept mm-hmm. saying that's nothing. You're too young. That can't be cancer. Let's just keep observing it. And um, my father is a doctor and he never wants to interfere with another doctor. But I think on the second year, um, he he said, let's do a mammogram. He had to convince the doctor. And the mammogram said, it's suspiciously malignant. And my doctor still said, don't worry, that's nothing. But my my father stepped in and he had to wage a bet with the doctor. You know, I had to humor him, you know, just please do the biopsy. And if I'm wrong, you know, I'll buy you a tennis racket. He was an avid tennis player. And of course, fathers know best parents know best have the best instincts it turned out to be positive and so i think that's when our advocacy journey began my my so the doctor gave me all the things to do when you know we were done taking the stitches out and my dad said don't read those orders i'm going to study the options so he 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 phoned all his former students his colleagues abroad his colleagues in the philippines different experts he started his research and then one of his students was uh, Dr. Diana Kua, was training under a doctor in Stanford who kind of summarized everything he had been hearing and who seemed like, you know, a voice of reason and a calm voice. So that's why we went to that doctor. Um, and the doctor really, I guess, um, she was a very good, compassionate doctor and competent. Mm-hmm. So that really helped all of us. And so it's something I wish on everyone. It was not an easy journey for me. I was never afraid of dying. I was afraid of dying because I wanted I want to go ahead of my loved ones. But what really bothered me the most when I was diagnosed was when the doctors in Stanford told me I would never have children. That's when my world started to collapse. It's like, parang ang dami na bubunti sa, you know, sa Manila. Bakit ako? Parang it's so hard pala. Um, and so, 
that that was the hardest for me to accept. And I was single at the time. I was just engaged. And um, you know, an aunt visited me in 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 California. And I told her, you know, because everybody was so somber and so sad about it. And I I told her in private, you know, the doctor said I'd never have children. And I thought she would be in a drama mode. She just said, Oh, what do they know? They're only doctors. Just pray, just pray. And that snapped me out of it. And that's the only option I had left to pray. But, you know, looking back now, prayer is not a last resort. It should be the first option. And so I just kept praying and praying. And I, I, I'm blessed with a, a daughter who just graduated from college a few weeks ago. So after so, that, I said, I have to give back. I cannot not give back with all these blessings I've had. Wow. That's quite inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, for, the cancer you journey, you know, was a wonderful spiritual journey. Many things happen. I mean... People think it's just all physical inconvenience. But, you know, there was a moment um, when I sat down and it's as if all the events in my life were placed in a card shuffler and they were shuffled and then they were reordered or resequenced. So I know why one event had to happen to the other. I saw the rational behind everything that happened to me in my life. It's it's really weird. And even when I was sitting in my bed when I first got home from my surgery, I actually felt a heavenly presence sit beside me. I You know there was a dent in the bed. So many, many other beautiful spiritual things have happened even within the family. And so there are many blessings. There are many blessings in disguise to cancer, even setting up this foundation. And also our foundation uh, is one of the founders of the Cancer Coalition Philippines, if I may plug. And we really spearheaded the lobbying of the passage of the cancer law in 2019. That's that's a very nice way to end also. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you so much for your for your brave work uh, through the years and and uh, this advocacy. Kara Magsanok, Alikpala, cancer survivor and advocate, filmmaker, Emmy Award finalist. Mabuhay ka. <laughs> Thank you, Howie. Thank you to everyone. God bless. Hi, I'm Howie Severino. Check out the Howie Severino podcast, an original for GMA News and Public Affairs. New episodes will stream every Thursday. Listen for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other platforms.